In this episode, Thomas Moore and Dr. Bill Randall explore their views about the larger picture of what life on this planet is all about and our place in it. We'll first hear from Thomas Moore, followed by Dr. Bill Randall. Yeah, there's so many things. Yes, let me pick one thing. That just yes, I, what I do, by the way, when I'm asked a question like that, is I see what comes into my mind. I don't think that I don't think what I'm going to say. I I, I see what floats in, and immediately what floated in was a whole a whole dimension of this soul work that I I really love, and it has to do with the soul of the world. That the world itself, the planet, has a soul. The planet is a living being, not just biologically, but psychologically. There's a psychology of the planet. It's a psychological being. It's a being just as an animal is psychological. And, uh, uh, you know, the early uh, medieval philosophers, Thomas Aquinas and people like that, talked about the vegetative soul, that we all have a soul of the vegetable. And that's part of us as human beings, but it's also in the world. So trees have a soul and plants and beans and peas and carrots have a soul. And uh, if we could get to the point to where we could appreciate that and allow them, I think what we human beings have to do is allow that the world has its own soul, its own goal, its own purpose, its own way of fulfilling itself, and uh, maybe its own sensitivities. You can see that plants are sensitive to, uh, to conditions all the time. And so if we could, if we could have that uh, larger sense. Now, another piece of this that my friends and I have been talking about for 20 years is the soul of things, the soul of manufactured things. That things, you know, you could somebody make something and they spend hours designing it and manufacturing it, even if it's made in a factory but probably better if something is handmade. There's something of the interiority of the maker that goes into the object. You know, that, that's the, I don't mean that in a kind of spooky sense. I just mean that naturally, because you're sitting there thinking about this thing and your own character is put into the manufacture of this object. It is going to get its soul partly through yours. You know, it's like the, that's how soul works. There's a participation that is shifting between the world soul and our soul. This is ancient thinking. It's not new. It goes way back to Plato, you know, that this is how, this is how it works, that there are all these souls overlapping and intersecting and interacting. And uh, so if we thought that, if we realized that the world out there that we, we look at as though, though we're out there like an object is really not. We share its soul, uh, its interiority, its psychology is our psychology. And its emotional life is our emotional life. If we had a greater sense of that, I think that we would, uh, we would be more human. We would be more alive. By objectifying the world, we objectify ourselves. Objectify means that you take the soul out of it. We deanimate the life, take anima, the soul, out of it. So uh, that's a big issue for me, to the soul of the world. Um, one, one thing it reminds me of is uh, uh, my Aristotle, where, where everything has a, a, f- a formal, material, efficient, and final cause. <laughs> yes. And right. that, that kind of, uh, so a table and a chair uh, uh, qualifies for that as well as every other being on the planet. They were, they kind of, as you said earlier in our talk, they, they got into some pretty good stuff back then, didn't they? They really did. And uh, I have a friend, Peter Kingsley, who, by the way, I met first in Vancouver. And uh, he and I became close friends then. And he has done a lot of work to show that, that what we call the Greek philosophers were really spiritual teachers and spiritual leaders. They had rituals, they had incubations, they had uh, temples and communities dedicated. They were not rationalistic philosophers off in a university office somewhere. Uh-huh. They were out there uh, leading people toward a more spiritual life. Uh-huh. And we've misinterpreted them mm. to be so rationalistic and abstract. So in that sense, you know, thinking in that way, then 
way back then, these were very interesting things going on. That sense that the world is, you get it in Plato so clearly, that the world is, is alive. It's, he said the world is an animal. Mm. The world is an animal. Now you got to think about that because we objectify it. We don't see that the world could be an animal. What a different perspective on life we'd have if we thought that way. And that's what Plato was teaching. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you very, very much for this. At least from my side of things, I'm already looking forward. We just heard from Thomas Moore speaking about what he calls planet soul, the larger picture that we live in, the world that we live in. And uh, we'll now hear from Dr. Bill Randall, who does call it actually the larger picture. I asked Thomas Moore this question as well, and um, about the larger picture. Do you, do you have a sense of the larger picture? He spoke about uh, uh, the fact that he'd gone back to studying Greek philosophy and Plato and folks like that, and the fact that the universe has a soul, it, ha it has a spirit, a soul, mm. that everything is alive. Mm. Even tables and chairs and so on, mm. because they're made by human beings, they have our spirit in them. Mm. And he said, so, you know, contrary to something inert, that, that really our, our lives, our spirit is ongoing and mm. is all part of this larger picture. I'd have to re read more about that or, or mm. talk to him more about that, but the basic idea... So I'm asking you the yeah. uh, similar question, if you have a different view or some sense of what, what what's going on. <laughs> By the way, if I could just throw this in here, I had the opportunity to uh, to meet Thomas Moore, and that's when I uh, shared with him your book, which he was very, very excited to have and contacted you afterwards. Um, yes, I have you to thank, actually, yeah. for uh, making that connection, which is uh, one step to the next has led to him being interviewed for the, this series. Yes and now having you interviewed for the series. Well, so. what I have to say is that the thing that impressed me most about meeting him was how easy he was to be around, to be with. I mean, here I was in the presence of the great author of all these best-selling books, Care of the Soul, etc. But he was extremely down-to-earth and soulful in a nice, uh, relaxed kind of way. And you had the sense that you could just kind of hang out and have great conversations with him about all kinds of things. Um, but maybe part of that at easeness that he exuded would have to do with his sense of the bigger picture, as you say. Um, when I was a minister in my spare time, when I wasn't reading the theology books or whatever to prepare for the Sunday sermon, I was drawn to books like the Dancing Wu Li Masters and the Tao of Physics, which were hot sellers at that particular time, sort of mid 80s. And they were making the point that the subatomic world consists not so much of things, but rather no things, uh, and instead sort of pulsating, intersecting energy fields. I recall reading, uh, I think it was earlier this year, a fascinating book called The Field by the uh, English uh, UK writer Lynn McTaggart, who you know picks up on this idea that is coming from many fields like physics and chemistry and cosmology, that the, the universe running through it is this pulsating complex field of energies, or perhaps one great big capital E energy. And that, you know, as you start to think about that, this table that we're sitting at right now uh, is ultimately no thing. It's, it's if, we could, if we could look at it closely enough with a microscope, we would see these pulsating energy fields. And the reason that we can't put our hand through the table is because that energy has a strength and power in and of itself. Um, so I think that, to me, uh, decreases the, the boundaries that we sort of put in place maybe arbitrarily between life and death, between up and down, between past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I think of death, to go back to that topic, you know, I, it comes naturally for me to think of it as transition, as, as moving from one energy mode, that, which is maybe focused around our physical bodies, to another energy mode. Yeah, well, I guess I'll leave that mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that enables me to have a kind of a, a trust, a, a faith in the in the ground of being, so to speak, that, yes, I, I'm going to die. I hope it's not too painfully. Uh, I hope I die in a way that's meaningful for me and for other people. But the death itself, the sting has been, uh, has been removed quite a bit from it. And really just 
for me in the last couple of years for some reason. My, my father's death having a part to play in that process. 